Uh, so to introduce our presentation today, a little bit about the program. It is about Sidney George Fisher, who kept numerous diaries and observations about the changing Philadelphia landscape in the years before, during, and after the Civil War. Although not a practicing friend, he had Quaker relatives who proved or provided a context for his insights into the world around him. And a little bit about our presenter tonight, uh, that is Daniel W. Cross, who earned a doctorate in history at Yale University in 1968 and taught at the College of New Jersey from 1973 to 2014. Uh, his most recent book, Lincoln and the Politics of Slavery, The Other 13th Amendment, uh, The Other 13th Amendment, and the struggle to save the union was awarded the University of Virginia's Bobby and John Law Book Prize in American Civil War era history. Dan has recently published essays about Sidney George Fisher in the Philadelphia Magazine of History and Biography and the Journal of Civil War Era. Dan's wife, Betsy Crofts, is a member of Newtown Friends Meeting and they live in Southampton, Pennsylvania. But we're really thrilled that um, Dan could join us tonight and I'm really looking forward to the presentation. Uh, so Dan, you can go ahead and unmute and take it away. Oh, Dan, hold on a sec. I think you, we've got to unmute you first. So give us a sec. Perfect. Dan, you're good to go. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here tonight in the Arch Street Meeting House. Uh, thanks to Sean Connolly and Jen Gray for inviting me to speak. And thanks to Kayla Doyen for technical backstopping. This building has all kinds of good associations for my spouse, Betsy Maxfield Crofts, who grew up in Germantown meeting and attended yearly meeting sessions here. In 1967, when she and I were young and feisty, she spoke out at yearly meeting, urging it to take a bolder stand against the Vietnam War. My focus tonight is Sidney George Fisher. He may not be a household name, but he is the Philadelphian from his era whom we know the most about. That is because he kept a voluminous diary from his young adulthood in the 1830s until the end of his life in 1871. Fisher was a careful observer who always let you know what was on his mind. He recapitulated actual conversations soon after they occurred. He had a knack for pithy uh, character sketches. He encountered and wrote about some of the leading men of his era. Andrew Jackson, Jackson's nemesis, Nicholas Biddle, and Abraham Lincoln. The diary offers many important insights about the Civil War era. The highlights of the Fisher Diary appeared in this 1967 volume, but much remains unpublished at the magnificent archive on Locust Street, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. To get a handle on Fisher, we first must situate him in the Quaker world. His own life had little connection to the Society of Friends, but Fisher had illustrious Quaker antecedents. He was directly descended from James Logan, the most prominent Philadelphian of the early to mid 18th century, the agent for the Penn family and a central figure in the political life of the common. Fisher's grandmother, Sarah Logan Fisher, was the granddaughter of James Logan. She married Thomas Fisher, the son of an eminent Quaker merchant, Joshua Fisher. Joshua Fisher and Sons would remain a family business for the next several generations. Joshua Fisher, a devout Quaker, was born in Delaware in 18, 1706 and moved to Philadelphia in 1746. Before leaving Delaware, he sold his agricultural slaves and brought several household slaves with him. Subsequently, he hosted the Quaker minister, John Woolman, who persuaded him that owning slaves was inconsistent with Christian principles. 
Fisher tried to make amends. He freed the slaves he had retained and set out to atone for earlier having sold others. He tracked down eight of them and paid to free them and their offspring. Joshua Fisher became a leader in the revolutionary era drive to abolish slavery in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia was the busiest port in North America, having extensive trade with other colonies, the British Isles and the Caribbean. Philadelphia's Quaker merchants in the colonial era were a paradoxical elite. They were cosmopolitans who traveled to all parts of the Atlantic world, especially to England, where they cultivated connections with fellow merchants who were invested in the American trade. At the same time, they remained part of a religious community that was frozen in time. Quaker patterns of worship, attire, and speech set friends apart. They had relinquished political authority in Pennsylvania when unable to square pacifist principles with the demands of governing. The troubles that poisoned relations between the British government and its North American colonies placed Philadelphia's Quakers in great difficulty. Trade disruptions threatened their livelihoods. As loyal British subjects, they deplored the drift toward armed rebellion. They refused to swear allegiance to the new revolutionary government to use its paper money or to pay war taxes. We know a good deal about Sidney George Fisher's grandmother, Sarah Logan Fisher. She was married to Thomas Fisher, a son of Joshua Fisher. Her diaries shed much light on the crisis her community faced during the latter 1770s. She was a faithful attender at meeting as many as three different worship sessions on Sundays. She appreciated hearing messages from those who could speak with power and authority. Sarah Logan Fisher was also a politically sophisticated observer. She counted herself among the loyal Britons who longed to restore the mild and gentle government of the best of kings. When she and others like her refused to place candles to illuminate their windows, as part of a July 4th anniversary celebration, patriotic vandals smashed their window panes. She regarded the occupying American forces as dirty creatures and a lawless banditti. In late summer 1777, the British army sailed up the Chesapeake from the south, threatening Philadelphia. Revolutionary authorities in the city demanded that prominent citizens suspected of being in communication with the British, either take a loyalty oath or face prosecution. Many Quakers refused to take the oath. Soon her beloved Tommy, two of his brothers, and many other leading Quakers were rounded up and dispatched to a remote frontier region, the Valley of Virginia. Tommy's father, Joshua, an elderly infirm widower, was spared the ordeal. But Sarah Logan Fisher, forlorn and desolate, and within weeks of lying in, complained, complained bitterly in her diary. You may remember Elizabeth Gray Vining's novel about the Virginia exiles. On the morning of September 26, Sarah Logan Fisher was delighted to witness the pleasing sight of the British Army. It had muscled aside American forces at Brandywine Creek on September 24 and marched into the city. The bright swords of the horse troop glittered in the sunlight. General Charles Cornwallis and his men followed a military band that played God Save Great George Our King. But the British position was not secure. Cornwallis parried an American counterattack at Germantown on October 4 but American forces continued to obstruct the river below Philadelphia, making it difficult to supply the British Army. Soon food supplies in the city dwindled and firewood became scarce as the winter season approached. British control of the city was made even less tenable when American forces defeated General John Burgoyne at Saratoga in upstate New York on October 17, as he attempted to drive south from Canada. Sarah Fisher gave birth to a daughter, Hannah, in early November. Her husband did not return until late April. Soon, however, the British Army departed for New York, where they could better maintain themselves, 
leaving the Fishers and other Philadelphia Quakers to face the arbitrary power of Congress. Religious disagreements appear to have estranged several of Sarah Logan Fisher's children from each other. They lived at a time when Quakers increasingly manifest an extreme group consciousness and emphasized the religious peculiarities which differentiated them from fellow Philadelphians. Quakers clung to distinctive forms of speech and attire that tended to set them apart. A narrow sectarian mentality resulted. Sarah Logan Fisher's daughter, Hannah, was a Quaker prodigy. Starting in her teens, she preached in meeting and sat on the front bench with the elders. Hannah was very strict in observing the Quaker rules of discipline as to dress, thereby annoying her brother, Joshua, who never liked the customs of the sect. Several times, he made a bonfire of her plain caps and dresses. Young Joshua Fisher, although named for his grandfather, rejected Quaker norms. He was disowned from meeting for joining a military company sent to quash the Whiskey Rebellion. But young Joshua Fisher died too soon. His widow, Elizabeth Powell Fisher, remained estranged from her late husband's Quaker relatives and brought up their son out of meeting. Fisher patriarchs, convinced that the widow and the Powell family abhorred Quakers and Quakerism, retaliated by cutting Joshua Fisher's son out of the family estate. This decision led to persistent ill feeling that carried far into the 19th century. Sidney George Fisher, the diarist and the center of our attention here this evening, had little connection with Quakerism. His father, James Logan Fisher, a brother to the disowned Joshua Fisher, married out of meeting. The diarist's mother, Eliza George Fisher from Tidewater, Maryland, was an Episcopalian. Although she emancipated the slaves she inherited, she never became a member of the Society of Friends. She and her husband are buried in St. Luke's Episcopal Churchyard in Germantown. When Quakerism is mentioned in his diary, Fisher describes a system of belief and practice that had no personal meaning for him. His entire outlook was secular. The diary's most extensive commentary on the Society of Friends occurred in December 1838, when he and his cousin, Joshua Francis Fisher, son of the mother who had been disinherited, attended the wedding of their pretty cousin, Esther or Hetty Smith, and Hannah's daughter. The event was held right here in the Arch Street Meeting House. And here are a couple of photos, one from 100 years ago, and one recent um, to give you a sense of where we are right now. The meeting house was crowded, this is back to 1838, by a multitude of witnesses to the ceremony. Hetty and her groom, Mifflin Wister, both were Quakers. The diarist who had not been to a Quaker meeting for many years reported sitting silently for about an hour, whereupon one of the elders rose and preached. His delivery was in the sing-song twang of all Quaker preachers. After she concluded, there was another long pause. Worcester and Hetty then rose and each made the usual declaration that they took each other for husband and wife. After another silent interval, the marriage contract was read and signed by the two principals. The wedding party then left the meeting. The diarist characterized the ceremony as tedious but performed with great composure and propriety. Hetty looked very pretty and was extremely well-dressed. She must have been less strict about plain attire than her mother had. So much for, Quaker, for Fisher's Quaker connections. Let me shift to consider other aspects of his diary. Sidney George Fisher had a keen detail for the details of everyday life. And by so doing, he reminds us how greatly the world of the early and mid 19th century differ from ours. Life in his time was far more precarious than we've come to expect. Hardly any modern medical knowledge existed. Dangerous epidemics occurred frequently. Some people in his era lived to a ripe old age, but many did not. 
Even within his privileged circle, there was no assurance of longevity. The specter of early death hung over him. His father, James Logan Fisher, died at the age of 31 in 1814. The eldest son, then only five years old, remembered vividly the sad spectacle of his mother weeping as she kissed the lifeless forehead of her husband. The young and dutiful widow, Eliza George Fisher, only lived a few years longer. She died in 1821 when she was just 36. She struggled bravely during her last extremity, dreading that her three young sons were about to be orphaned. Sidney was 12. One of his brothers, named for his father, also would die young. The tragedies the Fisher family faced do not dominate the diary. Instead, we encounter a socially well-connected young man as he tried to navigate the always daunting challenges of young adulthood. Fisher belonged to Philadelphia's refined society of educated and polished people with its complex codes of personal presentation and correct manners, and its whirl of dinners, dances, musical performances, and learned lectures. He always felt socially superior to a man who is not a gentleman by birth. The only way to have property, he pronounced snobbishly, is to inherit it. He dismissed all who did not measure up to his exacting standards, the common, the vulgar, the disagreeable. Young Fisher would not fraternize with rowdy bachelors who think and talk of nothing but play, bets, horses, dogs, and women. But in the privacy of his diary, Fisher had plenty to say about the young women in his circle. The conventions of the time brought together men in their mid to late twenties with eligible women as much as a decade younger. One evening he was bewitched by an 18 year old who displayed classic eyes full liquid black and fringed by long lashes, plus raven hair, arched eyebrows, and a lovely mouth with even white teeth. The youngster also had a rich and clear complexion, a full voluptuous figure, a sweet smile and intelligent expression. She was both graceful and dignified. The besotted diarist talked to her all evening and told her she was the most beautiful creature I had ever seen. One year later, he wrote more circumspectly about meeting yet another very pretty creature, only 17, but with a beautiful figure fully developed and a lovely face. Yet another 18-year-old soon appeared displaying a beautiful neck, shoulders, and bust. Fisher repeatedly commended Elizabeth Ingersoll, a charming person with a most delightful voice, a graceful, gentle manner, and a very pleasing, intelligent countenance. Six years his junior, she was always attractive, if not beautiful, and the most agreeable young woman in his circle. Unfortunately, Fisher deplored her father's politics. This was no small matter. Charles Jared Ingersoll, although a prominent attorney and politician, was an outspoken Jacksonian Democrat which appalled most other well-born Philadelphians. Andrew Jackson's war against Nicholas Biddle and the Second Bank of the United States played poorly in the city where the bank's headquarters were located, in the Greek Revival Building, still standing today on Chestnut Street, designed to resemble the Parthenon in Athens. Fisher considered Andrew Jackson a dangerous demagogue who trampled on the Constitution and threatened to take power from the educated classes and place it in dangerous hands. Fisher frequently complained that democratic government enabled the poorest, the most ignorant, the most degraded members of the community to exercise the same political power as the most wealthy, enlightened, and moral. In 1844, anti-Catholic mobs invaded an Irish neighborhood in Kensington where they encountered armed resistance and burned two Catholic churches. The disorder, Fisher surmised, mirrored the French Revolution when boys and women cheered on the rioters and carried weapons to them. He mused morbidly about how civilization in Europe and America 
could be destroyed by the eruption of a dark mass of ignorance and brutality, which lies beneath it like the fires of a volcano. Fisher and 40 other upscale acquaintances and friends joined a volunteer militia to help restore order and were posted on an all night patrol near here at Fifth and Race as city authorities scrambled to regain control. He found the experience both novel and exciting. For the first time in my life, I had a musket on my shoulder, but he lamented that weak government lacked the power to keep the peace. Politicians who courted popular favor instinctively hesitated to take strong steps to nip trouble in the bud. Meanwhile, Fisher continued to be attracted to Elizabeth Ingersoll, who remained unmarried. They frequently encountered each other at social occasions and he was tempted, but he was constrained by another insurmountable problem, his want of fortune. The horrible prospect of holding a regular job depressed Fisher. He quit the legal profession after deciding it meant intellectual suicide. His uncertain prospects raised questions about his suitability. His younger brother, Henry, quickly acquired a handsome fortune by advising British capitalists who invested in American railroads. But Fisher had no career aspiration or direction. He inherited property that he intended to hold but his actual income fell well below his needs. His eminently practical brother urged Fisher to find a job that would pay, but the diarist demurred. I detest business in all its forms, he wrote. Entire freedom and independence are essential to my happiness. Rather than submit to a workaday regimen, he read widely, composed essays for newspapers and periodicals, and poured daily reflections into his diary. He tried to pioneer a role as a public intellectual, but he was too idiosyncratic to make much of an impact or to develop a following. Even though he felt drawn to Elizabeth Ingersoll by an irresistible destiny, Fisher Dither, in an agony of doubt and heartily ashamed of my own weakness, he could not make up my mind what to do. His indecision continued for years. Were he to take the plunge, he feared, it would appear that he had married for money. The diary tells us nothing about how he finally came to end his procrastination, but we do know that the two eventually wed in 1851. He then was 42 and she was 36. The observant Fisher knew that he lived in an era of material improvement. He welcomed the arrival of steam-powered railroads and ships. He knew that anthracite coal fueled the manufacture of iron and made Philadelphia the premier industrial city in the nation. He noted attentively the appearance of new technologies. New rail lines, the precursors of those still in use today, spurred suburban building booms. Hundreds of attractively landscaped cottages and villas the rose in Germantown and all the way up to Chestnut Hill, allowing residents to enjoy the pleasure of country life and at the same time attend to business in town. Fisher applauded indoor plumbing and gas lighting, now found in homes of moderate cost. Other recent inventions could facilitate labor and multiply and cheapen the comforts and accommodations of life. For instance, an ingenious sewing machine enabled his wife to perform in an hour as much work as could be done with a needle in a day. But history and tradition loom larger for Fisher than novelty or innovation. The grand homes built or owned by his ancestors and kinfolk shaped his outlook on life and affirmed his status as a gentleman, someone who's inherited wealth and education and manners separated him from the common herd. The Stenton estate once comprised 500 rural acres. The mansion still stands on a much reduced lot in the heart of North Philadelphia, close to the Wayne Junction station on Septa's suburban rail line. Stenton was built in the 1820s by the eminent James Logan, the diarist's great-great-grandfather. Logan's granddaughter, Sarah Logan Fisher, the diarist's grandmother, grew up in Stanton. 
During his young years, the future diarist frequently visited Stanton to see his widowed aunt, Deborah Norris Logan. Aunt Logan, Fisher recalled, treated him with particular kindness and affection. There are not many places in America like Stanton, Fisher observed in 1860. It has the prestige of time and the associations of one family attached to it. The hereditary ownership of land, he wrote, can visibly connect generations of a family together, the present with the past. Here we encounter Fisher's passion for a social order dominated by a landowning elite. He often complained that the United States had unwisely deviated to empower the propertyless rabble. He imagined that English society and governance provided the proper standard. In England, he fantasized, he would have owned a country estate and been a man of influence. He had no sense of how traditional aristocracies, whether in England or continental Europe, were forfeiting their advantages in the fast changing world of the 19th century. He instinctively opposed all efforts, whether in the United States or elsewhere, to widen the franchise and lay the foundations for democratic governance. He failed to grasp a key point stressed by his near contemporary, Alexis de Tocqueville, who saw that the opportunities offered by American democracy would enable humble immigrants and their children to prosper and rise. Think of the Kennedy family. A short distance to the north of Stanton, on what originally was part of the Stanton property and now is part of the Sal University campus, stood Wakefield, built during the 1790s by the diarist's grandfather, Thomas Fisher, the husband of Sarah Logan Fisher. She was the diarist uh, who wrote about the revolutionary era. As we have seen, Thomas Fisher was the son of the leading merchant, Joshua Fisher. Wakefield remained in the Fisher family and became the home of Fisher's guardian and Quaker uncle, William Logan Fisher, a son of Thomas Fisher and Sarah Logan Fisher. The diarist described Wakefield as a fine hereditary place with 200 acres complete with a large old fashioned garden, groves of old oaks and other noble forest trees standing above a lawn of rich grass. He prized the property not merely from early association but because it belonged to my family for three generations. Wakefield remained standing until modern times, but it was destroyed in a fire in 1985. Young Fisher had a complicated relationship with Uncle William, who took responsibility for his three orphan nephews. Fisher came to think that Uncle William had been wrongheaded and selfish and had mismanaged their inheritance. The diary diarist regretted that Uncle William sent him to the provincial Dickinson College. But Fisher also respected his Quaker-like uncle and his family. They lived on the estate which they inherited. They avoided ostentatious display. Their furniture, plain compared with modern luxury, belonged to those who lived before them. His uncle also had keen insights about the profitable possibilities of new industrial technology. Uncle William, who became a successful entrepreneur and capitalist, established a factory to manufacture stockings. It in an iron furnace out on the Susquehanna River built him an ample fortune. Uncle, uncle William recognized that new sources of wealth made obsolete his nephew's daydreams about a landed aristocracy. Forest Hill, the home where Fisher lived during the latter years of his life, was a pleasant place surrounded by fine trees and only four miles from town. Its 20 acres included noble oaks, tulip poplars, beeches, and horse chestnuts. The lofty leafy canopy supported by giant pillars created the effect of an outdoor cathedral. Located a few blocks northeast of the current Temple University Hospital, the property no longer is wooded and the home is long gone. Forest Hill enjoyed easy access to Philadelphia. Even before railroads arrived, 
Fisher could readily drive his horse and carriage into the city after breakfast and return in time for a late afternoon dinner. But Forest Hill did not belong to him or the Fisher family. Instead, it was owned by Charles Jared Ingersoll, his wife's father, who used it as a summer retreat. Fisher and his wife Elizabeth moved there temporarily after their marriage in 1851, with the understanding that her parents would continue to share the house in the summertime. It was never an easy arrangement. Initially, the Fishers moved back to town in the winter, as did the Ingersolls. But in 1857, he received an offer from his father-in-law to live at Forest Hill year-round free of rent. The Ingersolls also agreed to pay for repairs on the old house. Fisher feared becoming dependent on his in-laws, but he decided to accept this very liberal offer. The renovations included a new furnace to make the house more commodious for winter use. He welcomed the prospect of having his own study and library. He and Elizabeth remained at Forest Hill until his death in 1871. The house that most nourished Fisher's sense of identity was Mount Harmon in Cecil County, Maryland, at the northeastern corner of Chesapeake Bay. The diarist's mother, Eliza George, had grown up there. Mount Harmon was bequeathed to Fisher after the young mother's death. Mount Harmon still stands today on a hillside surrounded by the Sassafras River an estuary of the bay. More readily accessible by water than by land, the property originally was developed as a tobacco plantation. The brick mansion constructed in Georgian style around 1730 was restored in the 1960s by a wealthy heiress from the Tupac family. Once Fisher became an adult, he attempted to run the Mount Harmon estate as an absentee landlord and to support himself with profits from the crops grown there. The profits never really materialized. Fisher's diaries record at length the frustrations he encountered in attempting to manage the property from a distance. No longer a tobacco growing locale during his lifetime, Mount Harmon grew wheat and corn. Fisher, who styled himself a progressive agriculturalist, also planted peach orchards with the hope of marketing a profitable fresh crop in Philadelphia and Baltimore. Much to his annoyance, the weather's eccentricities and unpredictability, a late frost or a dry summer, meant that the farm's output and profits varied from year to year. Fisher's brother Henry, a hard-headed businessman, urged him to sell Mount Harmon, but Fisher treasured the property. Mount Harmon reinforced Fisher's fantasies about a landed aristocracy. His self-image centered around the ideal of an English gentleman secure in his property and status, deferred to by his lessers and politically influential. He refused to see how men of this type were losing their grip in England or how their closest American counterparts, the large slaveholders of the South, were leading the United States into a terrible, bloody impasse. I became interested in Fisher because his mature years coincided with a critical period in American history, the era of the North-South sectional crisis and the Civil War. Let me just hint at the riches the Fisher diary contains on these matters. He had keen insights he followed closely the political snarl of the 1850s that featured the rise of the Republican Party in 1856 and then its stunning victory in the presidential election of 1860. Let me just go back and forth between these two slides for a bit. You can see here in 1856, the arrival of the Republican Party as a force on the national scene carrying a majority of states in the North. But if you look closely, you will see that they failed to carry Pennsylvania and several other states in the lower North and thereby failed to win the election. Everybody knew that for the next go around, 
that what was happening in Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Illinois would determine the next election. So it's not surprising that the Republicans chose somebody from one of these states, in this case, Illinois, to be their candidate in 1860. And as you can see, this strategy worked well. Abraham Lincoln succeeded in carrying nearly the entire North, including the states that the party had failed to hold in 1860. You can see here that if you look at these um, graphs on the side that Lincoln carried a majority of the electoral votes, even though he failed to carry a majority of the popular vote. The election was split four different ways and he did get more popular votes than anybody else. Before the war, slaveholders demanded absolute power to perpetuate the slave system. This the North had long conceded. Most white Northerners, even if vaguely distressed that some men claimed the right to buy and sell fellow humans, accepted that the slave system where it existed could not be touched. This was Fisher's view too. So long as slavery posed no threat to the larger national enterprise, it would be tolerated. But Northerners like Fisher resented Southern overreach, a minority imposing its will on the majority. They abhorred white Southern demands to extend slavery and granted additional protections as manifested by the Mexican War, Fugitive Slave Act, and the abortive drive to make Kansas a slave state. They saw the South as a closed society where Northern newspapers could not circulate and where anti-slavery politicians dared not speak. Increasingly, Northerners condemned what they called a slave power conspiracy through which a minority of several hundred thousand slaveholders used their power in the Democratic Party to dominate the presidency, the United States Senate, and the Supreme Court, and hold millions of free white Northern men in political subjection. When slaveholders refused to accept the results of the 1860 election, that I still have pictured here, and instead disrupted the Union, they triggered the bloodiest and most protracted fighting in Europe or North America between 1815 and 1914. The cataclysm ultimately destroyed the world's largest slave system. Fisher did not call for emancipation as soon as the war started. Like Abraham Lincoln, whom he greatly admired, Fisher originally insisted that the purpose of the war was to restore the old union, not to transform it. It took a year and a half of bloody inclusive fighting before Lincoln concluded that the war must become a war for freedom, a war to build a new union rather than restore an old one. Fisher readily agreed. In 1862, he wrote a book which contended that the government fighting a civil war should not be bound by a constitutional straitjacket. He thereby pushed back against Democratic Party critics of the war effort, among them his Ingersoll in-laws and his rich cousin, Joshua Francis Fisher, who long ago before had attended Hetty Worcester, Worcester's wedding with him and who had married the daughter of a wealthy South Carolina family. In 1864, Fisher avidly supported Lincoln's re-election. The Great Central Fair, held in Logan Square to support the U.S. Sanitary Commission, brought the president briefly to Philadelphia on June 16. Note, note the recently completed, completed uh, Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul. Fisher was introduced to Lincoln at a small private reception. Even though nothing was said beyond the ordinary salutations and shaking hands, the diarist was much pleased. Lincoln impressed him as genial, animated, and kind. His whole bearing and aspect confirmed the opinion I had formed of him. But Fisher had no interest in the post-war efforts to create a truly multiracial democracy, an elusive objective that still remains out of reach and that still demands our support today. 
He regretted the wrongs of slavery, but he never would have favored emancipation had the South not disrupted the Union and started a war. He embraced the war for the Union, and he came to accept that the rebels who tried to destroy the Union deserved to lose their slaves. But he had no patience for what he saw as the misguided utopian quest to create a society in which African Americans could enjoy equal rights. We must deplore his views, but we need to know what he thought because many of his contemporaries were similarly bifurcated, pro-union but not pro-equality, and unable to grasp that the post-war struggle for equal rights was an essential sequel to the union war effort. In short, Fisher helps us to see the origins of some of the deep flaws in American society today. Fisher's diaries challenge a well-intentioned modern tendency to celebrate the Civil War as a triumph of moral principle. Americans today find it difficult to believe that most white Northerners only stumbled into a situation where abolition took place, as one historian has written, or that emancipation always was subsidiary to the overarching cause of union. Instead, we crave a story in which those who fully share early 21st century values led the way. We want to believe that enlightened white Americans saw that holding slaves and practicing racial discrimination was inconsistent with national values. We want to believe that the war was the moment when we reaffirmed our true national identity. But Fisher's diaries remind us that relatively few white Northerners ever gave priority to the humanitarian plight of the enslaved. Fisher was no abolitionist. His racial preconceptions prevented him from accepting equal citizen rights. His diaries show that sugar-coated interpretations of the Civil War era require special pleading. Fisher did not live to see the ultimate betrayal of Reconstruction and the nullification of the amended Constitution. During the last decade of his life, he was increasingly afflicted by what now would be called rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disease that affects the joints. His illness, which left him never free from pain, became worse toward the end of the war. Sometimes he was bedridden. Between 1864 and 69, he made months long summertime visits to an upstate New York spa, whose therapeutic waters were supposed to alleviate his condition. But his miseries continued. Three days after his last diary entry on July 5th, 1871, he died at the age of 63. His widow succumbed one year later. I await your questions and comments. Thank you, Dan. Um, so we've got a couple comments that uh, have come in to the chat with everyone and a couple of uh, comments that came in directly to my chat. I'm gonna start with the public comments uh, or questions first. Uh, and I think the one submitted by uh, Anita is actually a great place to start because it, it kind of speaks to this complicated um, legacy towards uh, Northerners during the Civil War and, and how, you know, a lot of their writing is, is used. So her question is, uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about the affordances of using diaries as primary sources for understanding history and the limitations of using those diaries. For instance, I can imagine uh, diaries provide a rich detail, and in some cases, of course, dependent on the diarist, but also present a challenge to historians. So here's the root of the question. How do you have safeguards from having one person represent larger trends, norms, and realities? Well, it's certainly true that I have characterized Fisher here as having a set of beliefs that were widely shared among white Northerners. Um, there's ample evidence of this. Um, the kind of what I call sugar-coated recollection we have of the Civil War is that, gee, you know, people, white Americans finally woke up and realized that holding slaves was wrong, mistreating black people was wrong, 
and we ought to change things and fix it. Um, in fact, I'm sorry to say, um, abolition and emancipation were an outgrowth of circumstances that had not really been predicted or expected in advance. Uh, the outbreak of war was a great surprise to almost all Americans. And it's only once the war has started and you get this brutal dynamic of uh, tremendous bloodshed with no end in sight that significant numbers of white Northerners come around to the idea uh, that emancipation would be necessary to defeat the rebels and win the war. And that does become majority sentiment in the, in the North during wartime. But many Northerners remained uh, unwilling to go that far. All of Fisher's Democratic relatives, uh, for example, opposed emancipation. Um, on the broader question of the use of diaries and the selective uh, kind of focus that they bring, it's what might be called an occupational hazard. I've enjoyed at several points in my career, dipping deeply into diaries. Um, I did a couple of books about Virginia that drew upon the diaries of two obscure uh, white Virginians, uh, but which opened up for me uh, the world in which they lived and gave me a lot of insights into what was stirring down South and how the South ends up um, blundering into this situation of starting a war, which of course, absolutely boomeranged. I mean, the Civil War was designed by the people who uh, launched it uh, to protect the slave system from Northern interference. But nothing could more quickly have ended slavery um, than the war. Um, so the war turned out to be, an, if you will, a bit of a suicide mission. And, uh, I have found diaries have helped me to understand what it was that white Southerners were thinking as they headed down that road. So thank you for both those questions. Um, our next question is about uh, the Buchanan presidency. And in your research, did Fisher express any opinions on the Buchanan presidency itself? Well, James Buchanan was the president who immediately preceded Abraham Lincoln. He's the only person from Philadelphia who's ever been president, of Pennsylvania rather, who's ever been president of the United States. And he was a Northern Democrat with Southern principles. He recognized that the Southern wing of the party was more powerful uh, within the Democratic Party. And he always bent over backwards to accommodate them. Um, the majority of members of his official cabinet were Southerners and slaveholders. Um, and so Buchanan in a way symbolizes the sort of situation that, that Northerners like Fisher got upset about. That is the undeserved power of the South and the Union, um, even though Buchanan is um, a Northerner, um, he uh, bends over backwards to accommodate the South and uh, the people that uh, he appoints to the Supreme Court um, and his friends in the U.S. Senate um, gave the Democratic Party a decidedly a Southern uh, kind of slant. And so... Um, Did Fisher comment on his presence? Fisher uh, is bitterly critical of, of, um, of Buchanan. Uh, Fisher was by this point, a, uh, an enthusiastic Republican and a supporter of Abraham Lincoln and was looking uh, along with other white Northerners uh, who didn't like the democratic stranglehold on the federal government to clean house and, and change things. But in voting for Lincoln, uh, he and other Northerners had no idea they were going to start or at least set in motion forces that would start a civil war. Um, very few Americans before 1860 uh, expected that a war might occur. Though it's interesting for me that Fisher from time to time muses in his diary in a sort of abstract way that if the South keeps um, 
persisting in its rule or ruin type course, uh, they may end up ruining themselves. Um, our next question is about the experience of a historian such as yourself, uh, including personal photos and doing the careful research such as pouring over a diary, uh, learning the distinctive qualities of the handwriting, contextualizing the opinions and observations included in those diaries, and then what it feels like as a historian to go visit some of these places uh, like Stenton, you know, a, personal, a personal picture of yours that you included, and to imagine what these, these characters were feeling um, and experiencing. So how, did, how does that feel to you as a historian to do that practice? Well, it was fun this past spring. Betsy and I went out and visited Stenton, uh, visited Mount Harmon. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we could not visit the other two places that were important to because they no longer stand. But I, I think there's, there's something to be learned by actually going where, you know, you've been reading about and seeing what you can sort of glean by uh, viewing the situation. We got a very nice tour around Stenton, which is, you know, right down Germantown, a bit down Germantown Avenue. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of a unappreciated treasure um, in Philadelphia. And you have to drive a little further to get out to uh, uh, Maryland to see Mount Harmon, but that's, that's something very much worth seeing. It's a it's a sort of classic, classic Chesapeake plantation sitting up at the very northern end of Chesapeake Bay. And it's, it's part of why Fisher was able to see both northern and southern perspectives. I mean, his mother grew up on this uh, plantation with slaves uh, in Maryland. And uh, his father comes from this uh, anti-slavery Quaker family uh, here in Philadelphia. Uh, so Fisher, I think, maybe had a sense for the uh, the way in which the North-South sectional crisis, um, you know, tore people uh, and and placed them in a kind of dangerous juxtaposition to each other. He had a sort of instinctive feeling for both the North and the South. Um, our uh, next comment actually is um, that Fisher brings to life the complexity of Northerners who had mixed views on African-American fellow citizens, and they might support the abolition of slavery, but they were unclear about what happened to emancipated slaves. And I think Fisher's kind of speaks to that as well. Well, Fisher, quite occasionally uh, has comments in his diary before the war, which make it clear that you would call him anti-slavery, but he would not have done anything to interfere with what he regarded as the right of slaveholders to continue holding slaves in the states where slavery was legal. Uh, he and most other Northerners had no, um, plan to get rid of slavery until the war starts. Uh, this, I think, is a, a very important point. Um, emancipation, which we today probably regard as the principal uh, consequence of the war, was in a sense a kind of inadvertent byproduct of a war to restore the Union. The great rallying cry in the, in the free states once the war started was to uh, um, bring the Union back together and to uh, uphold the flag which the wicked rebels had fired on. Um, emancipation was something of a, a side issue, at least for most white Northerners. Um, now, there were some, of course, that this does not apply well to. Um, here in Philadelphia, you have a network of abolitionists um, uh, many of them Hicksite Quakers, uh, led by um, Lucretia Mott and, and, and Miller McKim. 
Um, but, um, and many black folks too, of course, are part of this abolitionist network. Um, but I think Fisher's perspective and his diary help us to understand the tragic limitations of, of uh, what you might call white Northern readiness to, uh, uh, to follow the logic of emancipation. Uh, he was a real stick in the mud on the question of race. Uh, he just uh, couldn't visualize that, uh, that black people uh, could be equal members of American society. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna skip one question and then come back to it, but I think this is a good uh, a good jumping off place to ask why did you get interested in Fisher in the first place? I'm a historian with an interest in the political crisis that led to civil war, um, and I've been living the past fifty years in the state of Pennsylvania, and I came around to realize that hey. I should know more about how, how it was that Pennsylvania um, came to occupy such a pivotal position. If you go back to those um, maps I showed you a little while ago, in 1856, Pennsylvania is, is you know, the biggest of the free states of the North that isn't going for the new Republican Party. So I was interested in the question of what happened in Pennsylvania between 1856 and 60 um, that, that brought the state into the Republican coalition and made it possible for Lincoln to be elected president. And so I was spending a good bit of time down at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and started getting into the Fisher diary and realizing that this was a somewhat unknown treasure for understanding uh, what you might call the broader question of what it was white Northerners were thinking in the crisis that led to the war. Um, then the pandemic came along and it was no longer possible to get down to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I decided I would start working on this Fisher diary and write a couple of journal articles that, uh, that would shed light on what the Fisher Diary tells us about the political crisis before the war, and then another article on what the Fisher Diary tells us about uh, Pennsylvania during wartime and Reconstruction. So that's where I am right now. Um, I'm going to jump down to a question uh, that talks to the experience that Fisher had with Lincoln, uh, and imagining that Lincoln had a lot of, uh, of these meet and greets. And in your opinion, how did he perform Lincoln in such environments? Did he welcome the kind of opportunity or was it just a necessary part of his job as president? Well, any president has to undertake a lot of uh, sort of tedious and routine um, obligations, uh, meeting people, shaking hands, uh, it just comes with the territory. Um, Lincoln uh, was especially inclined to want to allow ordinary folk who wanted to come and visit him to uh, come to the uh, what was then called the executive mansion. And he would take time each day to uh, talk with visitors. So when he was up here in Philadelphia in June 64, um, I'm sure he met many other people the same day he met Fisher. Um, and I'm sure most of them were, you know, thrilled to be shaking hands with the president. And um, yet we have some reason to think that uh, Lincoln would have at least placed whom he was meeting because way back in the 1860 campaign, um, there had been efforts to try to uh, get Lincoln in touch uh, with, with Fisher and with Fisher's brother, the rich brother uh, who was the uh, go-between for the railroad promoters uh, because 
Um, the Republicans in Philadelphia were trying to get um, Lincoln to reach out to, if you will, more upscale people in Philadelphia as a means of, of um, improving his stature in the state. Uh, Lincoln well understood that in 1860, the issue that he had to keep emphasizing in, in Pennsylvania was the issue of a protective tariff. Um, and so there were lots of, of uh, messages being communicated and reassurances that if Lincoln became president, he would attend to the interests of the uh, iron industry here in Pennsylvania and make sure that there was a higher protective tariff on British iron. Um, so worrying about details of this sort and meeting people who would help show that he was a good guy on the tariff issue and that he was friends among the upscale types in Philadelphia uh, would, would be quite helpful. Uh, many, many upscale Philadelphians tended to look down their nose at Lincoln. Um, you know, they hadn't, of course, liked Andrew Jackson either. Um, and some of them uh, had, had moved toward the Republican Party. And actually, many former Whigs uh, among the Republican Party in Philadelphia decided in the end to go with Lincoln, uh, not for reasons that would tend to resonate with, um, with people today, but principally on this issue of the protective tariff. But um, I'm glad you asked the question about uh, Fisher and his brief face-to-face -face opportunity with Lincoln. It's a, a unique opportunity for sure. Um, two questions uh, that are kind of related to each other about locations that he lived in. I'm gonna start with the uh, Maryland connection first. Um, and the question is, you say he was a stick in the mud about emancipation. Does his diary say anything about other family of his uh, that were there uh, for or against emancipation or about his sympathetic uh, views and relatives um, related to his family of origin? There's quite a bit in the diaries about what's going on down in Maryland. Um, indeed, a whole separate volume has been published that are called his Mount Harmon diaries. Uh, extracted from uh, manuscripts that are fortunately held in the Historical Society of, of Pennsylvania. Um, there's a lot of often unpleasant insights about the, um, just the pervasive brutality of the slave system, which still existed at least to a modest extent in, in Maryland. Maryland and Delaware were the only slave states where slavery was in obvious decline uh, during the pre-war era. But that didn't mean that the slaveholders in, in those states were about to give up their prerogatives. And Fisher would sometimes uh, give you a, a glimpse of bad things that were going on there uh, but he would tend to kind of shrug his shoulders and say, well, what can you expect? Uh, um, um, these folks uh, have grown up all along convinced that they have the right to domineer over their slaves. And it's not my job to uh, tell them that they should do otherwise. Um, uh Question, and I'm actually, this is, I'm really interested about this one because I live not far uh, from, uh, oh, I lost it, I lost it, there it is. Oh, yes, um, have you traced what happened to Forest Hill after both of the Fishers uh, died? Because uh, the whole part of the city, nice town was redeveloped and lost to new users. Uh, so I'm, I live quite close to there and that whole redevelopment process um, is... I'm not quite sure just when Forest Hill went down, uh, but clearly the, the neighborhood 
uh, in the area of the um, Temple University Hospital. It's now, you know, in the center of North Philadelphia and, you know, much changed from uh, Fisher's description of the bucolic grounds uh, around Forest Hill. Um, happily, if you want a, a glimpse of what might have been back then, Stanton still stands. And you could see from the images that I ran that uh, there's still, you know, some nice grounds around Stanton, even though most of its property has long since become part of the city. Um, final question. Um, I, I know we're, we're, uh, we've done well with time, but uh, final question is about uh, Quakerism, actually. And did you find that his Quaker relatives had any effect on his writing or adult experience? Let me hear that once again, Sean. Did, did you find that um, Fisher's writings uh, were influenced at all by his Quaker family members, past and present, uh, or his adult life at all, influenced by his Quaker relatives? I think it's fair to say that his outlook on life was shaped by the knowledge that his um, his ancestor, Joshua Fisher, had played a prominent role in abolishing slavery in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, there's enough mention of that in the diary that I think it was appropriate for me to begin uh, with the segment about the, uh, uh, the Quakers in the Revolutionary Era. Um, but there were clearly limits uh, Quaker, I mean, Fisher was not, as I mentioned, a member of a meeting. Um, his parents had not been members of the meeting. And even though there were some relatives uh, who were, um, it does not appear that, that, that Fisher had anything like what you would call a spiritual outlook. Um, and, and so, it's, it's um, another angle here that just jumped into my mind is that his, his family had some connection to Mary Dyer, the Quaker who had been executed by the Puritans in Boston uh, back in the 17th century. And he uh, remarked several times on the fact that uh, he was descended from her. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's been a real, a real treat to learn about this uh, character's life. Um, and so I think we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone for joining us and a big thank you uh, to Dan for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, just a reminder that this presentation will be posted on our website and on YouTube. So if you would like to share it with Friends and family, feel free to check back on our website later uh, to be able to do that. If you would like to join our mailing list, uh, the link is included in the chat box, or I believe Kayla will be adding that to the chat box very soon. Uh, and you can um, hop on to our mailing list to find out about more upcoming programs in the future. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dan, for a great presentation. Have a great night, everyone. And thank you, Sean.